Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who wasn't intending to focus so much on this global post-punk moment when he started this channel. I didn't know what I was going to find when I started reviewing new music back in 2018, but I've done so many videos about bands like Shame, who I'm going to be reviewing now, their new album Food for Worms, that, that so much music that comes from the world, but primarily from the British Isles, which is in this weird kind of post-punk revival. I mean, we're talking, you know, shame and idols and dry cleaning and Black's Country New Road and MIDI, Squid, Sports Team, the new Murder Capital from this year, Fontaine's DC, Mush, Wet Leg. So much is going on here, and it's been a very fun thing to study. It's been interesting because as I've been going, I've been working my way through. And for the most part, my audience has been ahead of me, you know, because when someone watches my videos, I haven't been paying attention until 2018. So I didn't review the first Shame album. So when I reviewed Drunk, Drunk Tank Pink, uh, their first album had already come out, it had been kind of a big hit. And all of their fans and the fans of the genre were like, well, actually, well, actually, well, actually. But I did something. I went back and I read my notes for Drunk Tank Pink, and I'm, I, I'm really pleased with how I summarized this two years ago, how I summarized a lot of things in this movement. So I'm going to quote myself. Now, if you only watch this channel for shame, you're going to think I only say the same thing over and over again, but I think this is pretty good when I'm talking about this post-punk as being the only good home for rock and roll, and perhaps the only re avenue for rock and roll of any relevance, because Punk is pure affect, blues rock is a dead genre, hippie rock is a niche, maybe a little bit more interesting with neo-psychedelia, but heavy metal is a, has been sub into obscurity. So post-punk has absorbed so much music, and especially the term alternative and the term college rock, that everything gets wrapped up in it. What I think makes it so interesting is its elements of intelligence and self-awareness. There's a winkiness and a humor in all of the bands that I just mentioned, which I think are necessary in our current meta-referential, self-referential, post-modern time, right? And I'm not just trying to be some, you know, academic dick who's just saying like, duh, post-modern. It's true, you know, like we need to have rock and roll that knows it's rock and roll and thinks about being rock and roll or else it wouldn't seem real to us, right? That's just the moment that we're in. Like all these post-genres, it's filled with references and callbacks. It's always questioning its own sincerity, while at the same time, with that questioning, it's a safe place for swagger. Because part of rock and roll is swagger. Uh, but I don't know if it was the 90s, I don't know if it was Kurt Cobain, but it, really, swagger has been sort of killed. It's like swagger is just for dumb rock and, and aggressiveness. So... Post-punk, this post-punk moment, which a lot of people call post-Brexit, I personally am not comfortable assigning the political aspect of Brexit onto this or post-Brexit. I understand it, it probably has some kind of influence, but I think it's more the global moment. I think at some point we're going to look back at the cusp of the end of the, of the teens and the beginning of the 20s, and we're going to have some kind of term for this era. I don't know if it's going to be the post-Trump era, the post-Brexit era, if it's going to be called the COVID era. We're going to work it out in the history. There's definitely something happening here, and that is being reflected in the music, but I'm not going to simplify it just to, you know, Boris Johnson and weird buses. What makes it great for me is, as a rock and roll fan, it's guitar or piano-based rock music with the rawness of rock that, that can sometimes become smooth. The, the vagueness of post allows it to be so much. And, and this is where I'm going to build on what I said two years ago. Everything I just said is what I said two years ago. But what I've been working on is, is this, the, the power that post-punk has to allow a decentralization with the question of the lead singers really put uh, up front. It's not like you have to have a lead singer and a lead singer has to be a certain way. You know, that is the way things have been. But a lot of the emphasis on the sort of self-referentialness, the, the ambiguity about rock and roll itself is put into the lead singer. And that's where I've referred to what I call the lead singer knob. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot about knobs. And statistically, about 50% of you are going to be British watching this. I am aware that the word knob is slang for penis. That is funny to me. 
I really enjoy it when words <laughs> mean penis in other languages. I'm studying Serbian right now, Serbo-Croatian, and most words are slang for penis in Serbo-Croatian. But uh, I do mean a knob as in like a knob on a, on a stereo, okay? A fader, okay? So I've talked about the lead singer knob, you know? How much the more it's turned up, the more lead singer's a swagger, front person, usually man, but not always, a front person who's sitting there and is the focus and the center and the charisma and the energy and the atmosphere. But along with that, I think we could also say that with all this new, you know, this pro, this new wave of post-punk music, there's what I would call a post-knob as well, which is how experimental can it get? You know, how far out there can it get? Because then there's also a punk knob, you know, how loud and raucous can it get? I would say in addition to a, a, a punk knob, there's also a prog knob. How much can you mess around with uh, different time signatures or modalities or how well-trained are the musicians? Did they go to the East Bromwich School of Conservatory for crumpets and young musicians? You know, it's, it's all of these different, if we can imagine, I'd like you to imagine with me a hi-fi. Okay. Come on, come on. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it now, okay? Imagine that, that we've got a hi-fi, okay? Now imagine that each one of these is, that this is the post-punk amplifier, okay? So we have the lead singer knob, and we could turn up and down, and we have the, the, the post knob, how, how uh, experimental is it going to be, and the punk knob, how punky is it going to be, Okay? So each one of these kinds of knobs, how proggy is it going to be, all right? Is it going to have time signatures and changes? Is it not? So that's how I like to imagine it, that all of these bands have these sort of, uh, this balancing act. And I think people's preferences change depending on how much they like these knobs turned up. A lot of people love the prog stuff, you know? So those people tend to go more towards the blacks, you know, MIDI and uh, Country New Road, right? I tend to like a little bit less prog, but I like some prog, you know? So it's all this kind of question of, of, of what the balance is with all of these musicians. And uh, I think it's an interesting idea. You know, I'm not going to get scientific about it and sort of come up with some, hmm, I might, I'm not going to though, come up with some kind of like numerical system or some kind of five dimensional graph that can show how a band is. But when we come to this album, okay, Food for Worms by Shame, I think what we see is one of the better balanced post-punk bands with a lot of those knobs really on five, okay? The lead singer at times goes up to nine, but sometimes goes down to two, but in general is a lead singer, is very much in the front, but doesn't try to hide himself, nor does he try to be the front of everything. It can be experimental, especially in its desire to shift between genres and sounds, but not super experimental either. There's not a lot of like crazy weird backward sounds or, I don't know, hyper pop influences. The punk at times is quite punky, and at times it's actually kind of soft as well. It's right there. Really, the prog knob is the only knob that I would say is below five, you know, sort of below average, because it doesn't really try to go for a lot of different time signatures and show off a lot of, a lot of uh, exciting stuff, you know? So the, the one thing I would say this album adds is maybe we could throw on an epic knob. <laughs> epic knob. It's funny. Because of the, the penis thing. It's funny. You know, this album has an epic knob, <laughs> right? So at times it really seems to try to go for something more anthemic and majestic, and at times it doesn't. So when, when we think about this sort of perfectly calibrated album, you know, where it's at times brutal, at times precious, I think that's why I suspect... I suspect, and I haven't looked up the reviews of this album, I suspect the reviews are positive but not super high. I suspect the general fan reaction is positive but not enthusiastic. More than that, I expect over time people are going to appreciate this album more and more and more. I think it's a surprisingly subtle album because of its 
balance of all of these different things that make this moment in worldwide and British Isle specific post-punk music. The post-Brexit. And there's also probably something about like the geography of London happening here because they're from South London and that's different than North London. I guess some of the bands are from West London. I don't really know. I'm pretty sure South London, uh, that's where Crystal Palace plays in the Premier League. So I don't know. I like art history. The Crystal Palace was an important element of the influence of iron and glass in uh, 19th century architecture. But that's all I really know. So when you think about this album, you know, Food for Worms, it has a little bit extra scope and it did something interesting, which reminds me of Idols, because Idols brought in a marquee producer for their most recent album, being Kenny Beats, and here we have perhaps the most interesting aspect of this album that really makes it stand out and what makes you go, whoa, 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 whoa. Maybe there's something else happening here. They brought in Flood to produce this album. Now, if you don't know Flood, that's okay. You know his music. Produced Depeche Mode, Smashing Pumpkins, the best music by Nick Cave, the best music by U2. It's a weird thing about me. If you don't know, I'm not a big U2 fan, but Zuropa is one of my favorite albums. But whatever. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what that says about me. I think it says something cool about me. But what I like about Flood is you, when you hear him, you don't go, oh yeah, oh that's Flood. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not like one of these, like, producers whose stamp is so clear, you know, like, uh, like Jeff Lynne, Satan, Satan on earth, Satan with a, with curly hair, Jeff Lynne, right? Where every time you hear something he produced, everything he wiped his dirty mustache stink on, you just go, ugh, ugh, Jeff Lynne. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, you know, it's not like that. He's maybe more in the, in the sort of background but I did a little bit of research. I tried to find, like, has someone identified something that he does beyond just produce great music? <laughs> Which is the job of a producer, is to produce great music, you know? I mean, some producers, I think, they're able to, to, to get it out of people more. You know, like, that's, like they're, they're able to sort of find something, help people dig into a, uh, you know, get, get into a, a gear that they weren't in before. But what Billy Corgan, who a lot of the best music by Smashing Pumpkins was produced by Flood, says is that, and this comes from the Wikipedia, by the way, professors use Wikipedia too. It's, um, the, the skill of the 21st century is not research, it's discernment of the things you find. So uh, if you know how to discern good information from false, which you should be able to develop by learning how to research in college by doing real research, Wikipedia is totally safe. You just have to dis develop the skills of discernment. Billy Corgan says he can see ambience of the song. So his credit that he gives is how Flood is able to find the ambience and sort of push it onto the band, which makes this album quite interesting because it has a couple different ambiances. Ambiences, however you want to pronounce it, it has a couple different of those. Tons of knobs and a bunch of ambience. Um, and, and I think that must be part of what Flood is able to do. Besides having it just sound beautiful, having great instrumentation choices, lots of interesting mixing choices as well, which I'll get into. And, you know, this whole category is just nuts. Because, you know, this, I mean, this has been a terrible year for me. If you've been following the channel, you know, my dad died, and son had surgery, all that stuff. Blech. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible year. It's been hard keeping the channel going. I'm doing my best. I don't have time to listen to as much music as I normally listen to. So when I saw that a band I really liked released an album, I was like, yes, at least I'll do shame. At least I'll do shame. Shame wow, okay? Um, but the craziness of this category, this, this post-punk revival category, is we already have two albums that are in the running for album of the year. You know, Black Country New Road, if they ever released that as a live album, and Murder Capital. And there's a couple other albums which I just missed, because <laughs> there's just too much coming out. You know? So let, let's talk about, about this album in particular. Um, there is something interesting. Where I, I think the cover is one of the, better, one of the better covers of the year. Very interesting. Appears to be a woman who's probably had a mastectomy, I think, a single mastectomy, and these kind of weird hooded characters with suns and moons, and there's a theme of suns and moons on here. It's a little bit mysterious. It looks good. It reminds me a lot of the, of the cover of Murder Capital, where it's just like, I think they just paid an artist to do something good and interesting, uh, and it looks nice. Um, it's unclear how it matches any of the music, except for maybe the song Orchid. 
the title, Food for Worms, implies that the album is going to be an existential search, which it's not. It's not. I don't think. I don't think. Tell me if I'm wrong in the comments. God damn it, Sky. 15 minutes in. No one smashed the like bucket yet. <sighs> Would you please smash the like bucket? That way I get more people to watch my stuff even though I'm going through a tough time and <laughs> I don't have time to make as many videos, which means my, my algorithm's totally shot. All my metrics are totally shot, okay? I'm like, I'm like an NFT over here. Just <laughs> into the ground, okay? So subscribe if you haven't already. God, I'm pathetic. As far as I can tell, this album is not really a big existential interrogation into the meaninglessness of existence, as is implied by Food for Worms, implying that's what happens to us after we're dead. But I think maybe they just needed a title that was provocative. The whole album, and this is the real question, it's super satisfying, and I'm not sure if it is spectacular. Listen. Listen. I'm not sure if it's spectacular. Does that mean I am saying it is not spectacular? No. We need nuance in this 21st century world of criticism. And when I'm telling you I'm not sure, I'm saying this is one of these albums which could be so well balanced that I can't tell. It could be that in December, after living with this album for a year and playing it with my son, who loves all these, all these post-punk bands, then I'll be like, oh my God, I just cannot get away from this album. I just love all these little bits and all these little uh, production bits and its scope and its joy. Like, it could be that it's so well balanced that it's perfect, you know, that it's not like some kind of spectacular, you know, like how, uh, let's think about ice cream. Like sometimes there'll be an ice cream flavor and like, have you ever had tallow uh, and uh, tallow, lavender, and bacon on ice cream. Oh, it's so good. Oh, it's so You wouldn't think it's good that lavender, bacon, and tallow go well together, but it's so good. You should go to the salty spoon and have it, right? But like, okay, that's fine. Except if you, if you have like, just like a really good, I don't know, black raspberry flavor, you know, just like a simple flavor done well, it's better than all those complicated flavors which are more flashy. It's possible that this is just like a really good, a really good cup of, of uh, simple ice cream. Even the band is balanced. Everything on here is balanced, you know? Like no one in the band particularly sticks out. The guitarist does lots of nice solos, but they're not flashy. The drummer is very talented, does lots of cool things, but maybe it's the way it's mixed. You have to really listen to hear when he goes off. The bass player has a few moments of where he shines, but not a ton. Each member has a time to shine throughout the album, but it's not a priority. And it's part of what I love about this band. It's what I loved about them two years ago. They feel like a band that plays together. They just work together. They're a band. That's what they do. They're a band. That's what they do. And it feels like that. Obviously, we have to talk about the lead singer um, and the lyrics. And this is the big question I have for the entire album. Self-awareness. Either the lead singer is acutely self-aware and most of the lyrics are him, based on pictures I've seen in the band, shirtless, standing in front of a mirror, looking at himself with a mixture of, of curiosity and self-hatred and talking to himself in the second person. You've changed. Look at what you're doing. Oh, I mean, sorry, British accent. Oi, look at what you're doing. Oi. You've changed, oh, googly boo, right? And he's crying, you know, that's my Southern London accent, by the way. It's different than my Northern London accent. And he's sitting there and he's crying and he's staring at himself. Like, that's one thing. This could be a totally self-aware album. There's so much in the second person that it could be, though, however, it could be that all of the yous are actually about somebody else. <laughs> in which case, it's a lot less engaging. It's a lot less meaningful, at least to me, because singing songs about you, you used to be cool, you used to do things, you, you do too many drugs, yeah, I don't know. That's, that lacks self-awareness, it's not that interesting, it's sort of in that kind of high school lyrics, and there is a lot where I feel about them as like being a, a very successful high school band, I'll talk about that at times. You know, I remember writing lyrics in high school and a lot of times it'd be about like the you of like my parents or the you of some bad teacher or assistant principal or the you of some girl who had the audacity to break up with me because I was a, you know, 
whatever it was, not break up with me, to never talk to me, you know? So that, that's a question I have for you, not for me, for you, you know? Is this album self-aware or is it really just pointing fingers at people? So let's get to a step. Whenever possible, I like my example song, my homework to be the first song of the album. It makes things easier. It happens to work for this album. It's called Fingers of Steel. Click above the banana, above the banana, above the book, which I chose for reasons, but nothing too intentional. This shows the great movement and production of Flood and of this band. It starts with a soft, faraway piano. It starts with a beginning that makes you think the guy's about to say, and so it begins. He's playing this melody, and this is the most like millennial anthemic melody here. Like when I heard this, I'm like, oh my god, this is just gonna be like a like a like a, a future Subaru commercial, you know, like anthemic anthem, but but no, it it, it chills out. It's this uplifting melody, but the these plodding guitars take over. Great hopeful melody. Very segmented bit. Very segmented song. Lots of different sections. Happens a lot on this album. The drummer starts playing where he does the hi-hat on the twos and the four. Kind of like a Franz Ferdinand disco. Sort of ooze in the back. Is that because Flood's there and, and he has to put ooze everywhere because of Bono? I don't know. Cool time all the way through. If you listen to this on the headphones, it's like all different guitars and different channels. Lots of um, like single notes that are played and then inverted. Bonk, 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 ankle, 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 ankle. And then you're complaining a lot about the things that you got. Give in. These are these lyrics, right? Like the you. You're complaining a lot. Is it you or is it you? Is it the you in the mirror or the you at the other end of the finger, right? That's the question. I do like the way he sings it. You know, very kind of punky. You know, the lead singer knob here is pretty high. The punk knob is pretty high. You're complaining a lot. Complaining a lot. Good use of the chorus all the way throughout the album, which is like a, a choir of people singing. But the things that you got, give in. You know you're wasting away. You're wasting away. There's a sun outside, but you don't see it. Again, these are great lyrics if he's talking about himself. Not as good if he's talking about someone else, but that's fine. The chorus is interesting because it kind of everything. This fully layered song really peels back, and it's just this chorus of voices all singing together. The guitars are noodling. There's a lot of guitar noodling on their production here. Like take out the guitar, except for just being like, bing, bing, bong, bing, 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 you know, and usually in the right channel. Uh, this time you feel you've been found, but when you look, there's no one around. Again, is this the you at the end of the finger or the you in the mirror? I don't know. And then one of the best points of the whole album is the post-chorus instrumental. Leading up to this point, everything feels kind of segmented, like not played at the same time, like individual notes being played and sort of interlocking, but not coinciding. But this post-chorus instrumental, everyone's playing together. The guitars and this cool descending chords and warbling and the drums are just going ham on the cymbals. And they're just playing together and leads into a quiet part. And then the second verse. Now everyone's playing again. A little bit of piano pulsing. Bum, 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 bum. You know you're complaining. It's all aggravating to me. Is he talking to himself or not? I still don't know. And you're wondering now about all the things you could have done differently. You keep retracing all your steps so frequently. Just let it lie. It never helps. Instrumental outro with this great grindy guitar solo. Not trying to show off, just playing these notes. Maybe, maybe I hear some flood influence of this, this this distorted guitar in the background as well. All these great layers. So many great layers. Did you notice, by the way, if you're a fan of this album, there's actually ooze in the back? There's ooze in the back of this instrumental outro. And then the guitar goes out with these little individual notes and then a blank. Bang. According to Lyric Genius, the lead singer of the band, whose name I forget, I apologize, said this is about helping a mate and the frustrations that come with it. So maybe this is a you at the end of the finger, not a you in the mirror. Although if he's trying to help out, coming to terms with the fact that people can't be what you want them to be and sometimes there's anything you can do to help. So maybe that's actually a little bit more interesting that he's coming to terms with the fact that he can't help other people. I don't know. Then we get to the song Six Pack, which has a wah-wah pedal. A wah-wah pedal. I've been reviewing music for five years now, you know, three albums a week for five years. You do the math on that. It's a lot of albums. This might be the first Wawa pedal <laughs> I've heard. I remember I wanted the Wawa pedal more than anything because I just wanted to be like Jimi Hendrix. I just wanted to play the beginning to Voodoo Child, Slight Return. But here it's the funk Wawa pedal. It's actually kind of a punk funk song. Do you know what four words are about to come out of my mouth? 
Do you know what four words are about to come out of my mouth, which if you are a shame fan will make you so mad, you're gonna take away that like, you're gonna throw on a down thumb and you're gonna, you're gonna smash your computer onto the table and throw it out the window and burn me in effigy? Get the eyebrows right when you make the little paper mache Professor Sky. This is a lot like early Red Hot Chili Peppers. Not the bad stuff, not post uh, under the bridge, like the early stuff, the early bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I own a lot of a lot of early Red Hot Chili Peppers albums, uh, which I just bought because I thought I was supposed to back in the '90s. When you're an alternative kid, that's just how you felt. Uh, but but this is like a good version of early Red Hot Chili Peppers. Kind of a nice little shuffle. It has again that kind of high school charm. This whole thing sounds like a riff that would become up like a good riff by a high school thing. There's a great bit here, with just bass and singing, and it's not just a high school song. It's not just a Chili Peppers song, but it's sort of in that realm, you know. All these lyrics where he's really punk here, like he's very very punk. Like if there's the punk knob, it's up towards eight or nine because he's kind of like yelling and screaming. And it's about this magical room where you get everything you want, like you get a puppy and and you get a six pack and every scratch card is like, oh, went, uh, uh, you know? And it's it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting idea for a song. There's maybe a little bit of like uh, post-apocalyptic uh, view of consumerism and the emptiness of consumerism that could be there. There's a cool little funky cool down bit which shows how hardworking the drummer is. Everything in this room is just for you, religion. More you lyrics. I'm not sure who the you is. I think this you is not an individual. It's more of like a you as like a society, which is a more interesting. I, okay, so yesterday I was going for a walk and I was thinking about like coming up with a hierarchy of pronouns that you sing about. Like the most interesting is I, <laughs> least interesting is you. I'd say the second most interesting is is maybe we, and then, or maybe he or she. Anyways, I'm not gonna do that on this video. At some point I'm going to. Next song is called Yankees. Baseball season is starting. I, I wish all Yankees fan, all Yankees fans to get the, uh, Get the food poisoning I just got last weekend. And Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge of the Yankees looks like Randy from Pee Wee's Playhouse. Okay? I said that, and now you're going to look up Pee Wee's Playhouse. You're going to look up Randy. Like, that does look like Aaron Judge. Anyways. I'm just kidding. I don't wish that food poisoning on anybody. God. Damn, that was rough. Sweet guitar melody. This is what I'm talking about. All these different atmospheres. When we go back to Billy Corgan saying, what does Flood do well? There's all these great atmospheres on these albums. We just were in like early Chili Peppers. Now we had this sweet guitar and the guitar and voice go together, almost like pavementy. I want you without anything. I want you without all the skin. Kind of a grungy buildup, very pavementy on this song. Then we get to just bass and drums. And here, like the guitar becomes an accoutrement, you know, a little thing that's added, little gribbly bits on here. This is a trick that is done a lot. I don't know. Is this shame? Is this flood? Who is doing this? I don't know. Shame, wow. Uh, make me hate you even more, more you lyrics. I can't tell. Great descending guitars in the instrumental bit here. They start going down, then they go up, and then these lyrics, you hate my job because it's what you want to do, and all my friends, they hate you too. All the things you make me do, all these lies, all these scars, I don't care. I'll just take my dose, and I'll smile for a while. Okay, now we have this other theme in the album of drug usage, and it's unclear if like the whole thing is actually about drug usage and the way drug abuse changes you. There's a easy way to read this as being the confessions of a junkie. I don't know anything. I, I, I don't even know the guy's first name. I think it's Charlie Steen. Is that right? That's too close to Charlie Sheen. And I just said junkie. So maybe I'm thinking, I don't know what it is. That's the name that's popping up in my head. So I don't know. The guy might be straight edge for as far as I know. But there is a way to read a lot of these lyrics uh, about drugs and about drug usage and about the way people change. That could be. So I don't know. Next song is called Alibi, a real highlight of the song. Remember when I said I don't know if this album is great? I'm going to buy it, by the way. Thank you to my Patreons. I'm going to thank them later. I'm going to buy this album. I want to own this album. I want to listen to it all the time. Even though I don't know if it's great. Okay? Good sign. Good sign about an album. My hands are very cold, by the way. It's, it's, that's just a... It just came to my attention. When I touched my head, I'm like, it's cold. It means I have a warm heart. This song, Alibi, is a very, very, very cool. It has this like tight bass and and 
and drum groove. And then this sort of, sort of like bursting at the seams. And again, the guitar is sort of an accoutrement. This lead guitar is like whining in my right ear. I don't need no alibis. Uh, real kind of like punk yelling chorus. Jack says he loves me. I question that, I question that, I question that. Jack says he needs me. I question that. Jack says he wants to F me. I question that. Why am I not lyrics? I don't know. Here we have the first sort of real I lyrics, but it's in relationship to this Jack person. We don't know who Jack is, who he represents. I don't know. You know, in the second verse, the drums get more interesting. Lead guitars doing this droning thing. And the second chorus is more layers, more production. This is where I'm starting to think, God damn it, this all might actually be a masterpiece. I can't tell. Next song is called Adderall. Very powerful title for a song. Gentle guitar, soft voice, develops there. Um, Adderall. It, it turns out I learned this way after, like right before recording. This is Phoebe, Phoebe D. Bridgers singing Adderall, You've Got Nothing at All. So that's interesting to have her voice on here. Um, when we're talking about the, the sort of global post-punk moment that we're in, I think we'd have to include, I believe we'd have to include Lucy Dacus. Obviously, you know, the proto-martyr and those other bands too, but uh, whatever Boy Genius, whenever that comes out, I think you'd have to include Phoebe D. Bridgers. You know, I think it's part of this moment that's happening. And when, and when we look back at it, the way we look back at the 60s, we'll see them all, all together. Um, Adderall gets you through the day. Adderall, you pop it and slip away. Adderall, your parents really miss you. You've got nothing at all. Is this really about Adderall? <laughs> Okay, so the, the, the lead singer guy, who I'm just going to call Charlie Sheen from now on because I forget his real name, uh, is the observation of a person relying on prescription drugs. The pills shift their mental and physical state and alter their behavior. It's about how this affects them and those around them. It's a song of compassion, frustration, and the acceptance of change. It's coming to terms with the fact that sometimes you help and love and can't cure those around you, but as much as it causes us exasperation, you won't ever stop trying to help. Hey, maybe this guy's really nice and he's just trying to help people around him. Maybe it's not him who's the junkie. Maybe it's the people who are friends. I don't think Adderall is Adderall. Um, I know a lot of people who have been greatly helped by Adderall. Adderall is a great drug. All the, the entire class of focus in drugs are great. I mean, not for nothing. This channel wouldn't exist if I had been on Adderall. Because <laughs> if I had been on Adderall, I would have completely unlocked my intelligence at a much earlier age. But because I unlocked my intelligence at a later age, that made sure that I didn't get too high in the world of academia. I'm at a good school. I'm at a fine school. I have tenure. Not complaining, you know. But but I'm a super smart guy. I'm just going to say that. I'm a super smart guy. And if I had been an academic and, and i have been able to pay attention in high school and read at least one book throughout all of high school, I probably would have got into a better college and I would have unlocked all these great things in my brain. But as it was, I was just a mess. <laughs> just... I, I mean, I've, so what ended up happening was I developed, and this is an interesting thing, I developed, well, it's interesting to me, maybe not interesting to you, tell me in the comments, I developed strategies to deal with my ADD. So like when I write a paper, like when I wrote my thesis, I built it in. So I would work for three hours and I'd spend two of those three hours goofing around on, on Facebook or on forums looking up about Star Wars toys or movies or whatever. But like in that hour of time, I'd get a ton of work done. I would just take three hours through that one hour. So I built that in. So if I had Adderall, I don't know what I don't I don't know what I could have become. But hey, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have this channel as opposed to being a better academic with more books that no one's gonna read. At least a thousand people are gonna watch this video, which rules. I hope a thousand. If this doesn't have a thousand, would you share it with somebody? <laughs> Check out my bored ape. <laughs> okay. The way that he sings the second verse reminds me strongly of the opening words of the song Heroin by Lou Reed, which makes me think maybe Adderall is actually just a code word for heroin, right? It makes a lot more sense. Heroin, it gets you through the day. Heroin, you pop and slip away. Heroin, your parents really miss you. You've got nothing at all. It works a lot better, right? The bridge has this great, um, uh, well, there's like a great like single like note solo. We have the introduction of this word, you sold my life for me. There is an overarching theme to this album, which is selling and buying of life's, lives. Life's is, <clears throat> sellings of lives. Um, Great use of the posse chorus. Again, a bunch of people singing at once. I suppose Phoebe D. Bridgers is in there as well. Sweet kind of concluding lyrics. And this will end up connecting later, this idea of selling your life. Then we get to Orchid. Again, the amount of 
atmospheres that the flood and that shame is taking us through makes me say shame wow, okay? Acoustic chords, not just notes, chords. Guitar, acoustic, it's a waltz. What the hell is going on here? Again, this somehow reminds me of the charm of a really good uh, high school band, I don't know. Most, most kind of goth vocals. My daughter actually thought this was Black Country New Road because she thought that the singer reminded her of Isaac from Black Country New Road. I don't hear that. What I hear is Amjira from The Swans. Sort of, we were tourists in adolescence. We were lovers in regression. These are maybe the best lyrics on the album, by the way. We were tourists in adolescence. We were lovers in regression. And every time I hold your hand, I feel something different in your palm. Interesting, well-written, uh, away from rhyming and just breaking free of rhyming and just trying to say things. There's a cool like little jam bit in here, you know? There's almost like a little jazzy bit in here, like a little mandolin bit, little, little, little hey, you know what they did? They're like, hey, we're just gonna turn up the prog knob and just a do, just shh, don't tell anybody, the prog knob. Just a little bit of prog knob. Prog knob, okay. Uh, so you know, for any bands out there, you are totally free to take prog knob as the name of your band, okay? Just go for it. Totally. It's a great band name. Great band name. Uh, odd outro lyrics. I know you hide behind yourself, but I want you back to me. So here we're in we lyrics. So maybe this album, if, you know what? You know what? I, I was too black and white in my thinking. I do think these are you lyrics, but I don't think they're high school you lyrics like, you know, why did you give me detention, Mr. Uh, Schlesinger? That was the name of my assistant principal. Because of my ADD, I acted up a lot in high school. Mr. Schlesinger. First you was walking in... First you was playing with the beanbag when I told you not to play with the beanbag. <laughs> That's Mr. Schlesinger's fam famous line. Um, I don't think it's really like that, that kind of you. It does feel like it's maybe a you of loss. It's somebody who feels like he's losing somebody who's trying to help somebody and he can't. And maybe that's how it all ties together. I'm sorry, I'm working on this right now in front of the camera. I did not think of this before I hit record and I don't edit, so suck it, okay? It may be that the whole album is unified around these ideas of a guy who's trying to help somebody, maybe himself, but probably not, trying to help somebody who can't be helped and coming to terms with the fact that he can help them. The person who he's trying to help presumably is very self-destructive and is on a path to death, but perhaps he's realizing there's nothing to be done. And in the grand scheme of things, we're all on a path to death. And if we're all on a path to death, it means we are all going to be eventually food for worms. Mozart is food for worms. Jesus was food for worms. We're all food for worms, okay? We're all food for worms. Maybe that's what it is, this resignation about the inability to help people. He wants them back, but he knows they won't get them back. A cool metal outro as well. Then we get to the fall of Paul. The fall of Paul? Another stylistic change here. This might be another highlight. I don't know. Detuned guitars. <laughs> funky, sloppy drums. Great intro riff. Kind of funky. Again, a little funk punk, but not as not not like that bad Chili Peppers way, and like in a good way. Mostly spoken lyrics, and the kids and the rats, they seem to scurry and crawl. They're sliding through the cracks. They're bound to fall. The chorus, 24 times I called your name. It's in the air, it's in the air. And the refrain... <clears throat> The second verse has this like doubled voice here. Can't get older, can't get younger. <sighs> okay. I think. This is just me. This is just me. This is just this is just your your erstwhile professor with his full wall of Smith's posters over there. Okay. Uh, saying, <laughs> I I, th I think this is about dead kids. I think this is like Suffer the Little Children Part 2. Suffer the Little Children is the Smith song of the first album talking about a bunch of kids who are dead. Here it feels, right, like they got lost in the woods, the kids are dead, and they're looking for them in the woods, they're calling out their name 24 times, uh, can't get older, can't get younger. Who can't get older and who can't get younger? Dead people, right? So, I, just, I don't know. It could be. It doesn't really matter if I'm right on that. All these little kids being food for worms. Yeah, man. Spend a night in a, a pediatric emergency room? Damn. It's a carnival of nightmares, man. 
And then hearing like all these babies screaming, ugh, man, seeing kids hurt is really unpleasant. I don't like where this video is going. Uh, just great atmosphere here, this great instrumental bit, this like basically the way I just describe it is clanging madness, you know? Um, and then the, the last phase of the album, last couple of songs, gets more cohesive and more interesting as sort of like the epicness of the album. I'd say the epic knob gets turned up for the last four songs. As a matter of fact, the next song I thought was... The, the next two songs I thought was one song. One nine-minute song. It's so connected. And each of the songs is so modular, little different parts. Burning by Design bass and acoustic guitar intro, drums are playing like a slight march, coming back to this theme, I sold my life for you, and then later you sold, and then earlier you sold your life for me, I can't tell. Is this about fame? Is this about selling yourself for fame or for changing or for becoming a rock star? Is it about you being drugs? I sold my life for drugs. Uh, drugs sold my life for me. Is that what it's about? It could be. Again, we can read this whole thing as a big heroin narrative. I don't think it is, but it's possible. It's possible. I don't know. Um, love is vocal strain here. Really intriguing lyrics. You took my strife from me. You sold, I sold my life for you. It's really pointing towards this, this, this druggy interpretation, but, but I don't know. You know, what do I know? I don't, even know the, I don't even know the guy's name. Maybe the bass player writes all the lyrics, you know? It's an intentional thing, by the way. You might get pissed at me if you're like, how can you not know the name of the singer if you're doing an hour-long review? I, I think it's more interesting to know minimal biographical information about a band. Just look at their art, treat it as it is. Okay, I know they're from South London and not from... I mean, I wanted to know if they were from, I don't know, Birmingham or some other city in England, because that does often have an influence on the way things sound. So... Um, kind of post-chorus here. What does that girl see when she looks in the spoon? Does she see me or does she see you? Interesting, you know, like the, the spoon has the convex and the concave sides and like you can see different things. But also, I mean, God damn it, right? I mean, spoons are associated with heroin and they're talking about burning and fire. Uh, if, if I told you there's a song about selling yourself for something, uh, selling your life <clears throat> for something and there's spoons and fire in it, you just assume <laughs> It's about heroin. I don't care about the feeling anymore. When it hits, it's always raw. All right. Okay, I'm just calling it. I'm just calling it. I'm calling it Rolling Stones rule. It's about heroin. Okay. <laughs> I call it the Rolling Stones rule because between like 1968 and 1976, all their songs are about heroin. You just didn't know it. Um, loudest layers on here. Nirvana kind of grungy outro here. And then an upbeat outro. And then the, the most crucial part of this album, I think, is this bit in between songs, in between these two songs. Like there's this pulsing 90s bit, a small guitar solo, kind of unexpected. And the next song, Different Person, starts. This is the most ambitious song on the album, Different Person. It's modular and it's epic. And for the third time, I'm saying this is my favorite song on the album. So again, I'm thinking this might be a great album. Kind of just all these different parts that we go through. This quiet part, the acoustic guitars chugging along with the voice. I guess you're changing your accent almost almost reminds me of Sweater Song by Weezer. It's all about change. You feel like a different person with the same old tongue, you speak with a different accent now for fun. Again, who knows? Who knows if fame is an allegory for drugs, if drugs is an allegory for fame, or if I'm just totally wrong and I'm just seeing things. Great post-chorus with a breakdown bit here. Almost like a little disco part here, kind of a funk part here again. Very weird lyrics. Uh, fucking for the fun of it, crying as you ask him if he can change too, he can change for you. Again, like, is he self-referential? Is he just mad at a woman who's having sex? Like, what What do we make of Charlie Sheen? You know what? What do we make of this lead singer? I can't tell. It ends weirdly. You say you're different, but you're still the same. So the whole thing has been like, you're different, but now he's saying you're not different. You think you're different, but you're not. And this is my favorite turn on the album, my favorite surprise on the album because that's the truth very few people change you know like they you can think they change on the surface but rarely do they change underneath there's a little reverb on here where you think i think i think i hear a little, a little baba o'reilly by the who just a little bit in here some of the best drumming on the album happens here then we get to the final track all the people which sounds like a like a 
<laughs> like a bad Oasis song. All the people look at them walk. Damn, shots fired at Oasis. Did, I never got Oasis. Is, am, am I wrong? Am I wrong? I saw them in concert too. But like, am I wrong not ever getting Oasis? Like I always thought they were clowns. Like I always thought they were fake clowns who never made anything good. But people I know and like tell me that no, actually, Oasis is really good. That has nothing to do with shame. But you can tell me in the comments if there's something I'm missing there. Uh, cool kind of four count from the guitar. This happens a couple times on the album. Here, his voice is totally different. Charlie Sheen has all these different ways of singing which is very cool. Like his lead singer knob is very dynamic, right? <laughs> like he has like a sort of open mouth way of singing, almost like a valley girl. The more guitar noodles in the right channel, uh, cool chorus, all the people you're going to meet, don't you throw it all away because you can't love yourself. Oh, we're coming back to that theory that I came up with about what the whole album's about. I do think it is about a you, but it's about a you he's trying to help and it's about the hopelessness of trying to help somebody who can't love themselves because Spoiler, if you're a young person and you're trying to figure out how to make your way in the world, you can't help people, not really. <laughs> you can't help people who can't help themselves. You just can't. You just can't. You can't. You can waste your time. You can slam your head against the wall. But until someone can love themselves, you can't help them love themselves. Until someone wants to change, you can't help them change. You just can't do it. So just learn that now or learn that later. Listen to me now and believe me later. More pavement style verse here. Great, epic, and cool pre chorus. Just again, look at what I wrote here in my notes. Could be an insane grower. So who knows? There's a real out of tune quality of his voice. It's another thing that he's doing where he's not singing perfectly in tune, which is great. Repeats the chorus again, but now it gets anthemic. We return to the anthemic from the beginning. Remember how I thought the whole beginning of the album was going to be this thing that was like super anthemic, super kind of millennial, oh, we oh, we oh stuff. You got this open hi hat. Don't throw it away because you don't love yourself. Just very likable, kind of like a jam band at the ending. And then it ends with him saying, and it's finished. And if you listen to the album on repeat, like I've been doing on a streaming service, it starts off with that song that feels like it should begin with him saying, and so it begins. It's a nice whole album, well-conceived, well thought of, super duper well-balanced. So there you go. These are my Patreons. Damn it, I forgot to write Marley Turnbull's name more clearly again. I'm sorry, you get another shout out. They're gonna help me buy the Shame album. So thank you to them, okay? How's the effigy going? Remember when I said you were gonna burn me an effigy? I've had a weird video, man. And women, and non-binaries. I've had a weird weird video, everybody. I've had a weird week, weird month. Weird everything. Thank you for watching everything. I just made my face itchy with paper. There's the camera.